Yo, Duke, pick up the phone! Yo. What's up? What's up? <laughs> what you doing, son? Nothing. Just chilling. When it comes to horror franchises, Scream has kind of been off my radar for a while. I feel like the first and second movie are really where it's sad, but once you get past that, the two that came out after those are not necessarily very good. So when I heard that the movie from last year was going to be Scream 5, the fifth installment in the series, I said, oh, okay, so we're just continuing down the road of these movies being terrible. But little did I know that uh, Scream 5 is actually a requel. Oh no! What is a requel, you ask? Well, it's when you reboot a franchise, but also play it off as a sequel to the original movie. Halloween just did this as you pay attention to the original first movie and the line of three movies that just came out to, you know, kind of make a new story out of a franchise that already had a beginning and an end to it. And that's kind of what Scream is doing here. It wants you to ignore the sequels and just pay attention to the original first movie and these new movies coming out as the sixth installment is already set to be out, well, very soon as of me making this video. What I really liked about it was it really paid homage to what Wes Craven did with the original first movie. I mean, the original movie is based off of actual events that happened, and of course you have these copycat killers who were obsessed with it, and Billy and Stu, who end up, by the end of it, getting, you know, figured out, and they end up dying in the end. My mom and dad are so I'm like, where can you take this movie then? If this movie is connected to the first one, how are we going to bring it together? What's going to go on here? Well, apparently, in this universe, there's a horror franchise called Stab, which is based off of the murders that Billy and Stu committed in this world from the first movie and apparently people are like use this as like a cult following is most you know there's a lot of movie franchises that have these followings and they are apparently on stab eight and now people are complaining because they just completely went out of left field with this movie they turned it into something that it's not and now the script needs to be rewritten for or at least in the killer's case needs to be rewritten because if you remember with these screen movies it's always two people and it's always two people that usually end up right in front of your face. Now, I'm not going to get to that point yet. Basically, here's our characters for this movie. We have Sam and Tara Carpenter, who are sisters in this movie. We have Amber Freeman, and of course, the return of Gail Weathers, Sidney Prescott, and Dewey as well. Hey, Terry. <laughs> Throw my finger. Oh, what the hell is that? <laughs> my ass. We have Richie, who is Sam's boyfriend. We have Wes Hicks, who is played by Dylan Minnette, the lead singer of Wallows, so I found that pretty interesting. Skeet Ulrich does appear as Billy Loomis in a bunch of, uh, not flashbacks, but Sam has these visions of Billy because, well, he's actually the real father of at least Sam. They don't necessarily mention if if Tara's in this picture, because in this movie, Tara's supposed to be five years younger than Sam's, so I don't know if he's Tara's father as well, probably not, but Sam's father somehow is Billy, which I didn't necessarily understand, because Mike, so did, did he have the kid before Sydney, or, because him and Sydney never have a kid, and if I'm not mistaken, it's been a while since I've seen the first movie, but didn't he die at the end of the first movie? Like, I don't know. That was the part that really was... I was like, that's what you're gonna do? But, again, how else are you going to connect the first movie to this one? You gotta kinda do something like that, in a way. Then we have Mindy and Chad, who are the twin brother and sister duo as well, and of course, they're all friends. Now, the thing with Sam is her and Tara haven't necessarily gotten along over the years. Sam left the house when she was 18. She got in trouble with the law a lot, but she found out that Tara has been attacked. Yeah, you remember how the first movie started off? Drew Barrymore got attacked and killed by the Scream Killer. Well, in this one, we have Tara Carpenter, played by 
Jenna Ortega, who seems to be a big name these days, especially when we're talking about horror and thrillers. She is at home by herself, and she gets a phone call from her landline. And at first she's thinking it's their mom's new boyfriend, but it slowly starts to turn into, oh, this is... This is the killer here, and the killer says, I'm outside of Amber, who's supposed to be Tara's best friend. I'm outside Amber's house. I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna kill her, but if you get these questions about these horror movie, the, the horror movie franchise stab right, then I will, you know, leave your friend alone, and I'll leave you alone, and we can call it a night. However, it was all a ploy because, well, the killer, although was at Amber's house, never wanted to attack Amber. He wanted to attack Tara, which he did. He stabbed her multiple times. That is something I will say in this movie. Tara gets stabbed, like, 40 to 50 times. I think you overestimate their chances. And yet still survives this whole movie. She spends the whole movie basically just limping around trying to recover from her stab wounds and all this kind of stuff. And also she's asthmatic. That doesn't necessarily matter much, but it plays into the ending as to what happens in general. So yeah, she gets attacked and Sam is at work with her boyfriend, Richie, and Sam gets a call from Wes because Sam used to babysit the these group of kids when they were younger, because remember, she's supposed to be like five years older than Tara and her friends. Wes says, hey, Tara was attacked, she's in the hospital, so Sam goes to see her, and just when they rekindle their relationship a little bit, things start to go sour again as Sam tells Tara the truth about Billy being her father and why she had left originally, saying that she had seen uh, their mom's diary and it was about how it's something about she found out that their mom was cheating on their dad and the dad didn't know and then when Sam went to confront their mom about it she said it out loud as their father was walking in the room so basically now Tara is blaming Sam for the reason that their father left and why she left at 18 was because she was just you know just I guess a selfish sister who didn't care about anybody but herself <laughs> Basically what I meant to say there, because I messed it up, was that Sam found this journal in the attic that their mom had written, and it was about how Sam wasn't actually her, or not hers, but the, the father at the time, it was actually Billy Loomis's daughter, and that's how Sam found out about that, and why their father originally left in the first place. It's complicated once you start to understand, it's like, oh, okay, so... Yeah, Sam and Tara don't have the same dad. They're more half-sisters at this point. But later in the movie, again, they rekindle. Sam says, look, I didn't leave because um, selfish or whatever. I left because, you know, with me being Billy Loomis's daughter, I didn't want anything to happen. I didn't want to end up hurting you because, hey, I mean, in horror movies, when you're the serial killer's kid, you always end up doing what they do at some point in time, I guess. Now, throughout this time, we're trying to figure out who the killer is, and because it's the ghost face killer, Sam and her boyfriend Richie decide to go to the one man in town they remember being one of the survivors, that being Dewey, played by none other than David Arquette. Now, of course, at this point in time, Dewey is kind of miserable. They forced him to retire from the police force after, I guess, multiple mistakes, and him and Gail Weathers are no longer married. They are divorced, so he just kind of lives alone in a trailer, in the middle of nowhere, but after some hesitation, he definitely agrees to go back and help because he wants to get the motherfucker, the ghost face killer. He wants to show people that he can still be the reliable person that he can be, and of course, he just wants all this to be over. He then calls uh, Sidney Prescott from obviously the first movie, and he says, Look, don't come here. You're married, you have two kids now, and we don't need you to be put in that danger again. And Gail eventually finds out through text from Dewey what's going on. However, with her still doing the whole news reporting thing, she comes back to, I think it was called Woodsboro, is where this is supposed to take place. And that's where her and Dewey kind of, you know, reconnect in one way or another. But it never really gets to a point where they fully fall in love with each other again. It kind of does, but it doesn't. So now we have Wes and his mother, who was the sheriff at the time, they're dead to go along with, well, I know there was a you know, couple of people beforehand, but they didn't really have much to do with the story. There was a, a guy who was hitting on Mason's girlfriend, and he didn't necessarily like that, so he was kind of like, you know, like, I'll beat you up, but the guy got kicked out anyway, and then the screen killer ended up killing that guy minutes later, so that guy had nothing to do with anything, I guess it was just because he got 
in the way. Now this movie is really, really cool because, again, it's similar to the first movie. What I like about it is it's self-aware. It almost acts as a parody of not just itself, but the movie before it and the other movies in this genre that kind of, you know, try to take itself seriously. You know, it's got all the cliches of a slasher film, and I like the fact that it's almost kind of meta in a way because they're talking about this stab franchise and how it's gone downhill and people are too obsessed with it when it's like that that's exactly how the Scream franchise can go. Even though the Scream franchise doesn't have eight movies, it's going to be up to six very soon. But I just found that kind of funny, considering, too, I think in the movie as well, the boyfriend Richie says, yeah, and, you know, it really starts to go downhill after five, which I'm like, huh, five, this is the fifth Scream movie? Like, it's just interesting how it's so self-aware, and I like movies that are that way, because now it gives me a different perspective as to how to watch this movie. Are there moments that are cheesy and predictable yeah but in the end that's how this is supposed to be if you're trying to take it as some sort of you know horror movie like serious kind of thing like a, a Halloween or whatever then of course your opinion of it is going to be different from others but if you're like the others who watch these movies and knows what goes on during these scream movies then you know that it's more a parody than it is a horror movie and that I can appreciate Duh, I'm stupid so of course, we're at the point in the movie, everybody's pointing fingers at each other, and when the screen killer shows up, there's always somebody gone, somebody out, and you're not necessarily knowing who the killer is yet. You know, you have your hunches in some people, but you come to find out that one of them is a character who's been in the movie the entire time, and the other one has been probably been in the movie the least of any of the friends and I kind of found it very very weird because one of these people was on my radar at first but I kind of counted them off because I'm like well I don't know maybe but it, it doesn't seem possible and it turns out I was right at least about one of them not both of them but we get to a point where Tara her sister and Sam's boyfriend Richie are leaving town because the screen killers after them but Tara doesn't have her inhaler. Her inhaler's missing. She needs it. She's very asthmatic, and she needs to get an inhaler. So she's like, well, there's a spare one at my friend Amber's house that I can just go get, and we'll run back in or whatever. This turned out to be a plan by Amber and, get ready for this, Richie, to lure them in the house while Amber is having a party, so that way the killing spree can c commence. Because, well, Amber and Richie, they're the ones behind this. I can't believe you've done this. Yes. I know, it's kind of out of left field, but again, Amber you barely see in the movie, and Richie you've seen in the movie basically the whole entire time, and it kind of makes sense, because if you remember at the beginning of the movie, the killer said he was at Amber's house and going to attack Amber, that was Richie who was talking to Tara, and there was other moments like when David Arquette Dewey gets stabbed, which that just broke my heart, he, he died. <laughs> That was Amber who had stabbed him because at the time Richie was with Sam and Tara because Sam supposedly texted him that Tara was in trouble at the hospital by herself, he needed to go check on her. But really he had probably been there the whole time planning this out with Amber because when Amber goes and grabs him and attacks him, she doesn't like stab him or anything, she just kind of like hits him and throws him out of the way, which that should have been a red flag right there that maybe it's Richie and somebody else because why would why would the, you know, ghost face killer who basically anybody he sees he just like stabs or slices their throat or whatever, why would he just kind of like elbow Richie and toss him to the side and not even kill him like it didn't make much sense to me to begin with but it never popped into my head like oh I'm stupid that that's why Richie didn't die he gets shot and stabbed in the movie there's a lot of shooting and stabbing going on in the movie considering too at the end of the movie both Gail Weathers and Sydney and Sam they've all been stabbed and yet, they're not getting medical attention, but the others are, as just when you think that Chad and Mindy, just when you thought they died, they end up surviving, and now it's leading to the movie where they're leaving Woodsboro, and they're going to New York City, and now the Scream Killer is 
in New York going to be after them now. There's people joining the cast list like Samara Weaving, Anya Taylor-Joy, Hayden Penetier. So they're adding more characters into this movie, as I think you should, because like I said, the Scream Killer always ends up being someone within the scene together in the friend group, and you can't just have the same four people come back and add nobody new to the picture to be suspicious about because you know it's not going to be one of those four friends, so who's it going to be this time? I guess we'll have to wait and see to find out, but I also know this won't be the last movie is I'm assuming this is going to be a trilogy of movies in itself that will, you know, kind of finish off what the original first movie had to offer, but Scream in itself it was nice. I wouldn't call it a masterpiece. Obviously, I think Wes Craven did it a whole lot better, but it definitely pays homage to Wes Craven's vision for the first movie, the original that he did, and he was just a masterpiece with a lot of stuff. He was always able to make characters, these killers, so scary, but at the same point in time, like when you look at Freddy Krueger and the Ghostface Killer, yeah, they're scary, but they always seem like they're just so, how do I put this, quick-witted, and they always are just throwing around insults and whatever, so it makes it even funnier, because Nightmare on Elm Street's not necessarily supposed to be a parody, but Freddy Krueger makes it funny. But with Scream, you're getting a horror movie, but also a parody, so of course you gotta make it a little bit intentionally hilarious at one point or another, but I would definitely recommend to watch. And I only watched this just because I was interested to see how they were going to toss the ghost face killer into New York City, and I said, well, if I don't watch this new movie, then I'm going to have no idea what's going on in the next installment when I end up seeing it. So... I had to cave and I had to watch it because, again, I hadn't cared about the Scream series for a while and I hope the sixth movie can do something even better to continue to add on to the story. I hope it keeps its parody aspect, but at the same point in time, I feel like it needs to change other than just, oh, we're going from here to here. It needs to, you know, do something different with the story, but continue on from Sam's story about being Billy's dad as she does end up stabbing the shit out of Richie at the end of the movie because she says, hey, don't fuck with a serial killer's uh, daughter because, well, you're just gonna end up getting the shit stabbed out of you. So she kind of did, you know, do the whole serial killer thing, but it was more in self-defense, so when she's doing it, you're like, oh, okay, you go. Like, you go, girl. I'm not, I have no problem with you doing it like this because you're getting attacked, so attack him back. Finish it off. And that's exactly what she did. I'd really like to hear your thoughts on the movie, though, in the comments down below, but until then, stay safe out there, and I will catch you all in the next one. I still prefer the Papadook. It's just been revoked.